You're listening to Historic Huguenot Street's weekly program on WFNP The Edge, where we discuss New Paltz history and the history of the Hudson Valley. I'm Caitlin Gallucci, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at Historic Huguenot Street, which is a nonprofit 10 acre National Historic Landmark District dedicated to preserving historic buildings, artifacts, and manuscripts, and promoting the stories of the Huguenot Street families who founded New Paltz. If you missed our show last week with SUNY New Paltz students and Huguenot Street interns, Allie Surgery and Miriam Ehrlich, you can listen to it anytime on our uh, on Historic Huguenot Street's YouTube channel. In fact, you can hear any of our past shows on our YouTube channel. Uh, this Saturday at 2 p.m. at Dale Hall, that's at 6 Broadhead Avenue, not the Dale Hall here on campus, We'll have a lecture by archivist and historian Eric Roth entitled From Hudson Valley Anarchist to Prussian Aristocrat, the story of Alita Mary Schoonmaker, Countess of Krakow. This should be a really great talk. Um, Alita was a young intellectual woman from Saugerties who married into aristocratic Germany. Uh, and tonight, lucky, um, I'm joined by Eric Roth here in the studio. Hi, Eric. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, so first, can you just tell me, tell us a bit about your background and your, your experience in historic research? Sure. Um, my experience really started at Historic Huguenot Street, where I was the librarian and archivist. Um, and it was my job to go through the collections and to make them accessible to researchers. While I was there, I started doing research to help inform the tours and the other public programs. Um, since then, I've also taught Hudson Valley history here at SUNY New Paltz, and I've been involved in the conference on New York State history. Great. Um, so how did you first discover the story of Alita Schoonmaker? Ah. So um, as archivist, it was my job to go through the collections. The collections are a lot like a historical maze, all cut up and put <laughs> into boxes. That sounds accurate. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it was my job to go through that and you know, help other researchers find what they were looking for in those collections. Um, and, you know, the collection of Alita, there was a number of letters um, that she had written and, and had received, um, both while she was in Germany and when she was back home. And, uh, you know, they're a little outside the normal collections of historic Huguenot Street, which mainly deal with the New Paltz area in the 18th and 19th mm -hmm. centuries. This collection was a little more unusual, and that's why I found it interesting and always wanted to come back to it. Yeah, <laughs> great. Um, so what exactly, I mean, I know you, you mentioned that they were, you know, it was not, not the usual kind of stuff that was in the archives, but so what about Alita's story or about Alita's letters inspired you to continue researching her? Uh, there are a number of things. Uh, first of all, um, it, she was such an extraordinary woman of her time and even beyond her time, um, and she saw really amazing things and was very articulate in how she wrote about them. You, know, you figure when you're archivist at a small historical society like New Paltz, dealing with these historical papers, you're dealing with a lot of, I mean, all archives are interesting in their own way. Sure. You're dealing with a lot of things like deeds for land and, you know, purchases at the general store and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of the more mundane parts of history, which you can piece together into interesting stories. But, you know, when you get a collection of these letters that are, you know, talking about, you know, the most, you know, the, uh, one of the most exciting places, you know, with, um, I think how to say this, um, she saw the rise of militarization in Germany and she was writing very eloquently about it and she was very horrified by it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, she was just so insightful in, in how she looked at things and, you know, being in the communities and seeing and then being able to express that. Um, so, you know, just being an interesting woman of her time and, you know, experiencing things that very few people of that time did. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was the main, main thing. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I mean, especially after the, f af you know, with our, in its historical context, to be able to see, to read things, you know, directly from someone um, who was right there during it. Without a doubt, she was a first-hand witness to Germany's rise and all of the pain that later came with that. Yeah. Um, so... She was a local. How yeah. did Alita end up in aristocratic Germany? Sure. So she came from a reasonably well-to-do middle-class family from Saugerties. You know, her, has, her father was listed in the census as a farmer. Um, okay. And, you know, in the rising middle class of America during the 1860s and 70s, uh, mainly 1870s, um, you know, it wasn't completely uncommon for a young woman, you know, with 
you know, real intellectual gifts um, and, you know, a reasonable background to go to Europe to school. Um, it didn't happen very often, but it happened. Mm -hmm. um, so she studied in Berlin when she was a teenager. And while she was in Berlin, she befriended this much older woman, um, maybe probably in her 60s at that point, named Elizabeth Atcherley. And she was a woman from England who uh, had married um, a nobleman from Germany by the name of Krakow. And uh, so these two women, the younger Alita Mary Screenmaker and the older uh, Elizabeth Atcherley, became very good friends and um, I think she was, uh, Elizabeth actually was really a mentor to Alita um, and certainly a confidant. They wrote letters back and forth when Alita was in America. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, Alita was closer to her than to her own family. Um, okay. You know, th this woman was very intellectual. She was a, a socialite. She was, she was hanging out with the Wagners, you know, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, you know, all the intellectual elite of the time, the musicians and artists and writers and, and everything. So this is a, this is a real dynamic woman. Um, and uh, when this woman fell ill in 1882, 83, um, Alita went from New York, uh, from the Hudson Valley, all the way to Germany to spend this woman's last months with her. Oh, wow. Um, and on this woman's deathbed, she arranged for Alita to become her successor. So Alita, at age 26, marries this woman's, you know, now widower. Um, he was about 30 years older than she was. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, this wide-eyed, intellectual young woman, you know, from Saugerties, you know, with a little bit of an anarchist streak or a radical streak, socialist streak maybe, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden she's now managing something like Downton Abbey. And, wow. Um, and wholly unprepared for it. <laughs> um, you know, and she struggles a bit, but, uh, you know, here she was in, in thrust into that life. And, uh, you know, what she saw um, was quite the surprise to her. And that's uh, um, leading into um, maybe the next question. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no. And that's interesting just to imagine then, I mean, so, you know, we've already said it's, it was, it's interesting to be able to get, you know, her her impression of what was going on in Germany during that time, which would have been fascinating anyway, but then now also to think about the fact that her impression would be very unique because she's not someone that spent, you know, was used to that lifestyle or expected to live that kind of life. You know, she was coming, it was totally foreign to her, literally. Oh, absolutely. She was completely surprised by what she was seeing around her. Wow. Both good and bad, although, yeah. you know. We'll get there. <laughs> so it really was kind of, you know, a very like, uh, I guess, a, a pretty American perspective, not just like a, a someone, you know. Oh, very much. Yeah. You know, one of the things she talks about a lot, especially in the published articles, um, while she was in Germany, um, you know, so so coming from America, you know. We think of it now, at that time, for women as being the dark ages, right? Where mm -hmm. you know, they had very little rights, they didn't have, didn't have the right to vote yet, and all of these things. But to someone like Alida, she felt that America was at the progressive end of the world, especially for women. And now she's going into conservative, aristocratic Germany on the edge of what was then Pol or what is now Poland. And what she found was a much harsher environment for women. Uh, women were not um, encouraged to speak, especially in the aristocratic circles, and to express their opinions and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, here's this woman who has uh, aspirations to be a writer, and um, you know, her, her political um, developments are awakening at this point. She's seeing things in the world and struggling. She's a reformer from America. She wants to reform things. She, you know, she saw women back in the States doing, you know, Susan B. Anthony, right? Right. Um, she, so now she goes to Germany, and that is absolutely taboo in wow. the world she's in. Um, and it's how she reacts to it that I think is what's most interesting. Wow. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, so how do you think a story like Alita's is relatable for people today? 
Um, I think it is absolutely relatable, maybe even more so today than yesterday or two right. days ago. <laughs> um, but uh, so, as I mentioned, she feels that she's stuck in this world. I mean, first of all, she did have, I mean, her husband was very devoted to her, and she did have seemingly a good relationship with him. She did bear a son um, who eventually came back to America with her. Um, and she did have friends in the aristocratic world, um, but she learned very quickly not to express her opinions. Um, mm. They were just not welcome. And, you know, she was said she's already flirted with anarchy she's calling herself a socialist at this point mm. she's very interested in the um the more radical writers in germany at the time and the artists and things like that um you know at the same time that she's living this very privileged life it's a kind of a strange contradiction yeah in but um so anyway she's there and she probably did just expected this is going to be this wonderful social experience and you know in a family experience but what she's seeing is she's sitting at these dinner tables and the the military caste which is the aristocracy in germany at that time they're sitting there talking about fixing elections they're talking about wow. punishing people that are not voting their way um, you know, shaming, publicly shaming people and, you know, in a sense, ruining families uh -huh. because they're, you know, and she's sitting there being like, wait a minute, I feel this way. Right. And, you know, in a sense, being a woman and also, um, you know, just being of the aristocracy is not encouraged. So she finds her way. She gets out in the streets and she's meeting prostitutes and she's, you know, going to orphanages and, and tr looking at life and trying to make sense of it. And she finds an outlet mm -hmm. in her writing. You know, obviously she's writing letters back home to family and friends and things like that, and there's a lot that she's talking about. But she starts publishing articles in American journals, things like um, the Atlantic Monthly, the Independent, um, even Good Housekeeping, which at that time was a little edgier than it might be considered today. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, and she's, she wrote at least 40 articles, probably a oh, lot wow. more. I mean, I've been able to find 40. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, and some of them are nice and benign. They're about, you know, engineering in Germany or you know, writers in Germany, historians in Germany, and stuff like that, Christmas in Germany. But especially over time, there's this very clear critical bent that just keeps growing. And she's as she's seeing, and she's sitting at the table where they're fixing elections, as she's seeing, you know, the, the militarization, the attitudes of the young men that are becoming very arrogant and, you know, wanting to dominate the world. You know, in the 1880s, she's seen this, and she's publishing this stuff in the American papers. Wow. And, um, and when she finally comes back to the U.S. in 1901, after her husband dies, she's uh, well-known, I don't say well-known, but she's respected as a real expert. And she becomes a professor of a college in St. Louis. And, um, you oh. know, and her writings are, you know, frequently mentioned in the papers and things like that. So um, what I think is relatable, getting back to the question, is that here's a woman in really difficult circumstances with no voice. She is literally muzzled by tradition and, you know, the society. Mm -hmm. But she finds a way to make a difference. Yeah. And I think for all of us, that's something that's important. Right. Yeah. That is, that's inspiring. Um, what do you, th how do, how do you think, I don't, I don't know if this would have been something that would be visible in, in the research you did, but how her German family that she married into, how did they feel about the fact that she was pretty much a, a published author in, in America while she was I don't think they knew. I them. think she kept that secret. Wow. I mean, okay. think yeah. about no, because how did they know? <laughs> exactly. Because as you're telling me, I'm thinking, like, how did they, like, you know, it, I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a secret because that's I was thinking how would they really accept that? Yeah, and she was very clear. You know, once she had a few conversations early on that went kind of bad for her, she learned very quickly just to toe the line in mm. public. And then in private is publishing these articles, you know, um, in a sense warning America of about what she's seeing. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and then when she comes back to the U.S., she's not idle. Yes, she becomes a professor, but she also becomes a suffragist. She marches in, um, you know, the, the famous 1913 march in uh, New York City for mm -hmm. the suffrage cause. Um, and, you know, she joins the Peace Society, and she's still writing. She writes all the way up until about 1920. Uh, I can't find any articles after that. So she gets very busy and is trying to be very, you know, tell people what she knows even after that point yeah. when America finally goes to war even though she's really a pacifist in a lot of ways she supported the war because she's like I was there I know what we're up against right right 
And that's interesting. That's also very hopeful to hear that, you know, um, you know, having this this change of lifestyle and and being in aristocratic Germany and, and being a member of that aristocratic family didn't change her. When she came back, she was still the same kind of like right. passionate activist type of woman. Oh, oh, very much so. And, you know, there is the contradiction of her being, you know, benefiting from her title, but at the same time I'm sure, right. bashing the whole system. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, Secretly, yeah. It's somewhat <laughs> interesting. Yeah, um, definitely. But, yeah, and, and she, she's a philanthropist, too, when she comes back. She donates uh, what was called the Children's Fountain in Saugerties, which, you know, is no longer there, but it was for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, and she helped found the library in Saugerties. So, oh, wonderful. So she's pretty active here in some good ways. Cool. Um, we're going to take a quick break. This is WFMP The Edge. Hi, and welcome back. You're listening to Historic Huguenot Street's weekly program on WFMP The Edge. I'm Caitlin Colucci, and I'm speaking to archivist and historian Eric Roth about his upcoming talk at Huguenot Street this Saturday at 2 p.m. at Dale Hall on Alita Mary Schoonmaker. Um, so we just spent a bit of time talking specifically about uh, uh, what you discovered about Alita's story. Um, but you've done research on a number of topics in the Huguenot Street archives, such as the history of slavery in New Paltz as well. Um, can you tell us a bit about the, the, the process, the experience of using archival documents for research? Sure. Um, so I'm going to start by saying archives are really first-hand evidence of what has gone on before. Um, so you're a lot of times reading directly what somebody is saying or what they're trying to document. Um, but you're only getting a tiny piece of it, right? Sometimes you get a letter, sometimes you get a receipt, sometimes you get a will or, a, you know, a, a photograph. And you're trying to... And all of those things have questions associated with him, especially if you're looking into it. You know, what, who is this person? Why are they writing about this or whatever? So as a historian, when you're working with archives, you're trying to piece together a story by looking at lots of little pieces of evidence. Mm -hmm. And that, um, so that's challenging, you know, uh, because you're looking at everything from, okay, what is this specific document telling me, but what's the context surrounding it? What's the world? You know, looking at Alita's letters, okay, they're interesting. They're a lot more interesting when you realize what she, what she's dealing with. So it's a lot about sure. asking a historical question of the document and then going out and doing more research, sometimes with other archives, sometimes with stuff that's been written by other historians and, you know, or whatever, and you're just trying to find answers to questions. What I love about historical research is that you start out with one question, and it leads to questions you never would even thought of before. <laughs> I'm sure. So it is absolutely teaching you things, but it's all about exploring. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so what have been, if you can think, if you have any in particular, but what have been some of your most rewarding finds while doing archival research? I don't know. That's a really tough question. I mean, they're all <laughs> kind of rewarding in a way. I mean, I guess what I love to do m most of all with it is give people voices that, in a sense, no longer have one. I mean, we're only here on Earth for a short time, right? Yeah. And, you know, you think about the things that you've created that you might leave behind. That's your voice permanently going forward as long as it's not destroyed. So going back in time and finding the voices, say, of slave, enslaved Africans in New Paltz or, you know, the early Huguenots and what they were dealing with, um, you know, and trying to get the real story as much as possible through the archives that are there. That, to me, is the rewarding piece of it. I know that's not a very specific uh, answer, but... No, it totally makes sense, you know, though. You know, understanding, you know, the context that they were in, the, the life, the, the world that they were in at the time that they had to make certain choices, and then mm -hmm. understand their choices and then what happened because of them. You know, that's something we don't always... We can't do for our own lives, you know, but you can do it for others. And the other thing is, these are places and times that are no longer... You know, New Paltz of 1700 is not, you right. know, even New York City of 1800 <laughs> is not, right. you know. So this is a place times that no longer exist, mm -hmm. and that feeds the imagination to me. Mm -hmm. So that's other, also why it's interesting. And people and places and things and ideas and times that no longer exist. Um, and understanding how they have, can inform us now. Yeah. No, I can see how that could be that how that would be so rewarding. I mean, because you bring a, a good point, which is you know, if not 
if, if these types of documents aren't weren't preserved or weren't saved, if there weren't things like archives, I mean, our understanding of the past would be kind of limited to, um, you know, anecdotal history or oral history. Absolutely. And I mean, you or know, official history. Yeah. So to be able to, you know, the archives provide concrete evidence and the context for some of these things that, you know, rather than just relying on what we've heard, um, we can we can see it right in front of us. Without a doubt. I mean, if you've ever been at a party and you had two friends that you thought were both really cool and, and really should meet and talk, uh-huh. I feel like I'm doing that with a historical person. I'm like, I, sure. I, this person has some interesting things to say. I think you should hear them. That's <laughs> kind of what this is about, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so are you working on any research projects currently? I mean, other than um, the Krakow research at the Alita Mary Schoonmaker, which is still ongoing. I'm really just scratching the surface here. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, other than that, I, um, I do historical music as well. Um, I play the classical right. guitar, and I specialize in 19th century guitar music, classical guitar music. Um, and that's kind of my main interest these days. Um, mm-hmm. the, the research is a little bit of a sideline right now. Um, but it's the same kind of idea where I'm, you know, finding this music and trying to share it with the world. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Um, again, Eric's talk from Hudson Valley Anarchist to Prussian Aristocrat, the story of Alita Mary Schoonmaker, Countess of Krakow, will take place at Dale Hall at 6 Broadhead Avenue this Saturday at 2 p.m. Uh, the presentation will also feature a temporary exhibit of uh, documents from the archives um, curated by archivist and librarian Carrie Allmendinger. You can register for this program at huguenotstreet.org slash RSVP. Tickets will also be available at the door. Um, just kind of a save the date note, um, the following Saturday on November 19th, we'll have another program called Behind Closed Doors, A Peak in Our Bedrooms. This will be a special tour given by our board vice chair, Sandy Levy, which will bring guests into the three upstairs bedrooms of the Deo House. Earlier this year, the Deo House bedrooms were restyled with Levy's assistance to interpret over 100 years of decorative art styles. The tour will specifically highlight pieces from Historic Huguenot Street's collections, some pieces not seen in decades from the Federal, Empire, and Victorian eras. Uh, This event will begin with a reception in the Dubois Fort at 81 Huguenot Street, catered by Main Course. You can register for this at huguenotstreet.org slash behind hyphen closed hyphen doors. And because only a limited number of people can tour the house at a time, this will most likely sell out prior to the event. So please register online if you're interested in that. It's an old Fort History Club event. So it's $25 for new members and $20 if you are already a member of the old Fort History Club. We're wrapping up now. But listeners can tune in every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. for the rest of the semester at WFMP.org or 88.7 FM to hear more from Historic Huguenot Street. Visit HuguenotStreet.org for information on all of our upcoming events. You can also follow us on social media, sign up for our email list to stay informed on what's happening on the street. Thanks for listening.